everybody in here. Well, it's good. It's good to see you. The countdown is on. It's 11 days, and then we're going to be involved with the King of Kings, and uh, we can't wait to see what God's going to do. Uh, I asked the church in the first service to pray for John. Uh, we thought about going and getting getting something to calm him down, maybe uh, some kind of medicine. If y'all, if any of y'all got something that maybe you could share it. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, there's a lot involved, a lot going on. And uh, I think the biggest stress is we got a new mic system, microphone system, and I think it's got one or two demons. Uh, we got it worked out. We got we had a excellent system that worked. Oh, <laughs> I prayed that's what happened. But anyway, we can't wait to see what God's going to do. I hope you've been inviting friends. Uh, I know for my wife uh, filled out all the cards and mailed to our neighborhood. Friend, if they'll come and be a part, it's going to be a great production. And we just know that God's going to do stuff. Also, I just want to say something about these kids. Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> I love it. I love it. Yes, yeah, sir. I'd like to see some of you get up here one day. Uh, you know, we're teaching our children something very valuable by putting them up on the stage. Now, I know they were, some of them, a little frightened to do that. But they overcame that and stood up and sung before this crowd and shared their song. But what we're teaching them is so vitally important. And it's, we're going to have, no doubt, some strong spiritual leaders come out of these children and they're getting rid of the stage fright where they can stand before people. And we don't realize how important stuff like that is to our kids. And I thank God for those in our church that are working with them and helping them to get up and praise the Lord. Amen? I love that. I love that. Well, today, I would like you to take your Bibles and uh, turn to John 18 again. But also hold it there and go over and turn to uh, Matthew 26 because we're going to be looking at some of what was going on in Matthew's gospel as well as John's gospel. Last week we talked to you about how Jesus became submissive to the will of God. He said that his hour had come, his hour for him to be that lamb that John the Baptist pointed to one day when Jesus was walking down towards the river uh, to be baptized by John the Baptist. And John pointed and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Now it was time for that lamb to give his life as a sacrifice for your sins and my sins. And it was not by happenstance that it was happening at this very time. You know what was happening at this very time. It was the Feast of Passover. And uh, it was something that the Jews celebrated every year at this time. As they would celebrate the lamb that was slaughtered back in Egypt. And the blood of that lamb was placed over the doorpost so when the death angel would pass by, they would see the blood and pass over them. But there's something else important about that lamb back there. They were to eat that lamb. They partook of that lamb. And what is going to happen in just a few days is that the lamb of God that John talked about and that the Passover pointed to was going to take place at the same time that uh, the Israelites would offer up that sacrificial lamb for the sins of the people 
that would put off the sins for another year, but there was going to be another lamb that was going to be sacrificed that would take away the sin forever. And that was Jesus. He entered this hour. And he submitted to it. His hour had come. We looked at that last week. But we also looked at the treachery of one man by the name of Judas who betrayed the Lord Jesus. And he did it with a kiss to identify who Jesus was to the soldiers that came. Not only the soldiers, but the high priest and their soldiers came to take the Lord Jesus Christ. But today we're going to look at another character in this passage in 18, verse 10, by a man by the name Peter. We, every one of us in this room can identify with Peter. Peter is so much like us. I am so glad that God put in the Holy Scriptures all of the struggles that the Apostle Peter went through as even though he was one of God's children, but he was so much like all of us, and he struggled with so many issues just like us. And he is a perfect example of how we act sometimes as Christians. We're going to look at his symbol of of disobedience, his symbol of rebellion. In verse 10 of John 18, it tells us that uh, John had, I mean, Peter had a sword. And Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put up your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? May God add his richest blessing to his precious, precious holy word. We know that prior to this incident that all the disciples Peter and all the other disciples had courageously affirmed their devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that over in Matthew chapter 26 of how that they all said we would stand with with the Lord Jesus. It begins there in chapter 26. And look, beginning at verse 31, Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, Assuredly I say to you this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not betray you. I will not deny you. And notice what it said. And so said all the disciples. All of them. Peter especially was very boastful and said, I will not betray you. I will not do anything to hurt you. And Peter, in this passage, tried to prove it by bringing out his sword. And he drew it out and started to fight. Sort of sounds like an Oreite. Now, some of you don't understand that. But did you know a true Oreite, a true Oreite has a knife in his pocket. 
Amen, guys, those of you that are true Oriites. I've been here 35 years. I must not be one because I don't have a knife in my pocket, but just about everyone does. But Peter didn't normally carry a sword. He was a fisherman, but he was going to try to prove that he was not going to just turn against God, but he was going to go with him and not rebel against him, but he was going to stay with him all the way, even to death, if necessary. But I want you to understand in this situation that Peter's sword symbolizes rebellion against the will of God. So you see, Peter knew. God had already told them what was going to happen. Jesus had over and over again had told them what was going to take place. Peter should have known that Jesus would be arrested and that he would willingly surrender to his enemies. Now, the reason I know that is because over in Matthew's gospel again in chapter 16 and verse 21, it says this, from that time, Jesus began to to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised on the third day. And then in chapter 17, in verse 22 and through 23, it says basically the same thing. Now, while they were standing in Galilee, Jesus said to them, The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and the third day he will be raised up, and they were exceedingly sorrowful. They knew. Peter knew what was going to take place, what had to take place, what must take place, but yet he is in rebellion to the will of God and what God said was going to happen. And Peter, in this instance, made every mistake possible. For one thing, he fought the wrong enemy. He thought they were the enemy. Listen, people are not our enemy. The devil and his demons are our enemy. The principalities and the powers in the air are our enemy. Peter fought the wrong enemy. He used the wrong weapon, and we'll see that after a while. He had the wrong motive, and he accomplished the wrong result. And we'll see that as well. He was openly resisting the will of God and hindering the work that Jesus came to accomplish. I thought of something this morning as I was preaching in the first service. I had a good friend of mine in the service the other Sunday. He's a good man. A couple of Sundays goes. He's a good man. God has used him mightily. He he is a true, true shepherd of the flock. And he was trying to lead his church to what he felt God had led him. You see, I'm a firm believer that God is the shepherd, and we as pastors are under shepherds. And that God uses pastors to lead the flock. God doesn't use the shepherd to dictate to the flock, but to lead the flock. There's a vast difference there. A shepherd goes before the sheep. A true shepherd does. A bad shepherd pushes the sheep, and that won't work. 
But a good shepherd will lead. He will go out front. He will listen to God, and he will obey the Word of God and do what God tells him to do, to lead that flock into green pastures so that they can grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ so they can impact their communities in the world with the glorious news of the gospel. That's the way it works. But so happens in a lot of churches, though, as it did in this, this pastor's instance. The sheep try to lead and dictate what goes on. And they resisted the will of God for that church that this pastor, led by the Spirit of God, felt. Not only him, but another pastor, if I called his name, you would know him, is going through the same thing that I've been talking to and been trying to encourage them. He's going through the same thing, resisting the will of God. Now, I'm not telling you that, to say that's happening in Living Water Baptist Church. Because it hasn't. Since I've been your pastor of this church, you have followed my leadership. You have never, never gone against what I felt God wanted us to do. You've always been obedient to do that. And I've tried my best to lead you down paths that I felt that would be good for this church and for this community. And you've always followed and you didn't resist and have never resisted the will of God as far as I know. And I want to tell you, you ought to thank God for that, that we have a church like that. But Peter, in this instance, and a lot of people, a lot of times, do exactly like Peter did. He resisted the will of God. He knew what the will of God was. And he resisted the will of God. Well, I think we admire him for his courage. We admire him for his sincerity. And I believe it was a tremendous demonstration of zeal. But he didn't use the knowledge that he had in doing so. What he should have done was Submit to what was happening, but instead he fought against it. I know a lot of Christians like that. They know what the will of God is. They know. The Word of God has plainly been spoken to them. They've read it. They know what the will of God is. But they resist it. Just like Peter they resist it. I think the reason Peter fell so miserably was that he argued with the Lord when Jesus warned him that he would deny his master that very night. I just read to you how he argued with him. Lord, that's not going to happen. Everybody else may uh, deny you. Everybody else may stumble. But not me. I'll never do that. I'll never do that. And he slept when he should have been awake. You know the story in the Garden of Gethsemane. As he went there to pray, he took Peter, James, and John. And while he was praying, Peter, James, and John fell asleep. Jesus questioned him, why, why are you sleeping? Could you not have watched with me for an hour? Instead of being vigilant in prayer with the Lord, he slept. He wasn't paying attention. And as I mentioned, he talked when he should have been listening to what God was saying. Instead of listening taking it to heart he's too quick to talk he said no I'll never do that but the thing that big mistake he made he imitated the very enemy 
who came to arrest Jesus, for they too had swords. They were armed. And he imitated them instead of imitating Jesus. Later on, Peter would learn that the sword of the Spirit is the weapon of God. Not a physical sword that you might hold in your hand, but he would learn later on that God would fight with spiritual tools instead of carnal tools. Ephesians 6, 17 says that we're to arm ourselves with the sword of the Spirit of God. Our weapon that we have is the Holy Spirit of God who resides in us that empowers us to do things that the flesh cannot do. And we'll see what that means in a little while. And Hebrews chapter 4 and 12 says that our weapon, our sword, is the Word of God. And it says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. But then in 2 Corinthians, the Bible says something that you and I need to hear today. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Peter would later on learn that. That the greatest weapon that Peter would have would be a spiritual weapon, not a physical weapon. We know that because on the day of Pentecost, After he was filled with the Holy Spirit of God, he stood on that day and willed a sword that was far greater than the sword he willed that day when he cut off Malchus' ear. It was the Word of God. He stood and he preached the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ And that sword pierced the hearts of 3,000 souls, and they were saved by the grace of God. What a mighty sword he used that day. He learned how to use the right sword. 30 years ago, 30 years ago, God taught me how to fight with his weapons of warfare. He taught me because of the Word of God that I had been studying, thinking all the time I was preaching to my congregation, but I was preaching to me because those scriptures came to life. And they taught me how to fight spiritual battles. And let me give you the scriptures that God used to help me understand how I am to fight. In Romans 12, the Bible says, Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals 
of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Then there's another passage over in 1 Peter that God used in my life. It's in 2nd chapter and verse 21. For to this you are called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth. For when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he committed himself to him who judges righteously. I want to tell you, those passages of Scripture just kept ringing over and over in my ear. And God began to teach me how I'm to fight and how to fight with his weapons and to do good to those that were despitefully using me and trying to hurt me. God showed me how to fight. And I want to tell you, God's way works. I'm here today to tell you that God's way works. You see, Jesus didn't need Peter's protection. As we said earlier, he could have called, the Bible says in Matthew 26, 12 legions of angels if he wanted to. I want to tell you, think of this. If Jesus had the power to stun an armed mob that came against them, that they would fall backwards as dead men, and if he could heal the severed ear of this servant, don't you think he could take care of himself? I think so. Listen, God doesn't need our protection. God doesn't need for us to fight the way the world fights. I think he's big enough, God, he can take care of himself. But Jesus willingly submitted, and he did it for us. And the right thing for Peter to have done would to have been to submit to the will of God, and not try to go against God's will. Did you know that Malchus represents us? Malchus, that servant that came against the Lord Jesus, that Peter cut off his ear. I want you to see what God, how he treated his enemy. He didn't judge him. Though he was a sinner standing with uh, enemies, deserving the wrath of God that was coming against him. But what did Jesus do? He didn't lash out at him like Peter did. But what did he do? He healed him. He healed him. I want to tell you, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, and I don't mean this in a hard way, I'm just telling you, according to the Scripture, you are an enemy of God. God doesn't judge you. He wants to heal you today. He wants to heal you spiritually. Because you are dead in the trespasses of your sin. And you need to be healed. And the only one that can heal you is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one that can make you whole. And he wants to do that for you today. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Now there's a point that I want to make here today about Peter, and I, I want 
to put some application here for us today. It's a sad thing when well-meaning but ignorant Christians take up a sword to defend the Lord Jesus Christ. You say, well, what, do you, what do you mean, Pastor? Let me, just, let me just say something to you today. I have never in my lifetime I don't think anybody in this building has ever seen the onslaught of Satan coming against Christianity and our world today. Never in my lifetime would I dream that we would see what we see on television, on the internet, that we see today. Sin is so open and so blatant. I remember as a young boy, even as they showed the, the family shows back in that day, they never had the husband and wife sleeping together. They had bunk beds in the same room, but never together. You remember that? It was not allowed for them to be in bed together. You never heard cur cursing? Never heard any of that? You never saw any kind of illicit sex, sex acts or anything like that on television? Never. Most all of it was G-rated. But look what's happening in our day and time. Even our commercials today, I've noticed this. I've been noticing this for some time. Even in our commercials today, just about every one of them shows a gay couple. They're trying to be politically correct. And it's amazing to me how they're doing that. And it's, they're flaunting it, they're throwing it in our face. Look what is happening with the pro-life movement in our day and time. Never in my lifetime have I seen it so blatant as even now they're saying, some are saying that you can even kill a baby after it's been born. I mean, governors are saying this. And it is, it is the movement of the radical left that is trying to drive America down the tubes. They are totally going against the laws of this country. And it's amazing to me that they can do it and get by with it. Never in my lifetime have I seen anything like it. Now, we can get so upset at this that we start fighting the way they fight. And Christianity is guilty of doing some of that. And what I'm telling you today is that God has not called us to fight the way the world fights. I'm against it. I don't like it, and I'm against it not because of my personal preferences. I'm against it because God's against it. And God has taught me and is teaching us that we don't fight the way the world fights. I'm all for standing up for the pro-life movement. And I'm not against uh, going to Abortion clinics and standing out front and trying to get people to stop. I'm not against that, but we're not to fight the way they fight. We're not to do anything that would injure somebody else, hurt somebody else. We're not to use words 
in a slanderous manner the way the world does. It's what I think this lesson of Peter is telling us, that our warfare is not uh, with carnal methods. Our spiritual warfare is taking the Word of God and speaking out truth in love and not hate. And if we can learn anything about Peter in this situation is that when you fight like Peter did, you hurt people. Peter hurt Malchus. He hurt him. And something else, Peter hurt the testimony of Christ. He hurt the testimony of Christ and gave a false impression that his disciples hate their enemies and try to destroy them. When we fight like the world, we tell our enemies we hate them. You say, well, preacher, when we stand up on the Word of God, they think we're hating them. Hey, that's not your problem. When you stand up and preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God in truth and just say, thus saith the Lord, and stand on the Word of God, that's not your problem. That's God's. He's the one that said it. Now, the way you say it, the way you say it has a lot to do with it. You're doing it in love. You are to do good unto those that despitefully use you and say all manners of evil against you. You do the very opposite of what they do. You say, well, pastor, that's just not in me. Oh, yes, it is if you've got the Spirit of God in you. You don't fight with carnal weapons. You fight with the Spirit of God and the Word of God. What, what did I say a little while ago? The Bible says it heaps coals of fire upon their head. They can't take it. They don't know how to handle it when you do good to them instead of evil. And if anything, Peter, Peter teaches us is that we're not out to hurt our enemies. Our enemies are not people. Our enemy is not that neighbor that's giving you a hard time. That enemy is not that husband or wife that is giving you a hard time. Or that brother or that sister that's giving you a hard time. Your enemy is the devil. And the way you fight your enemy, often Satan is using other people, but the way you do it, is you do good. Let me give you an example. Maybe you've got a neighbor that's just hard to live with. I mean, he's constantly, constantly reporting to the president of the HOA about you. And what you want to do is go over and whitewash their house. What if you baked a cake, went over and knocked on the door and said, I just thought of you today and I want to bake you a cake. What do you think that would do to that neighbor? If that didn't change them, next time bake them a pie. I'll tell you what had happened. They can't stand it. They can't stand it. Listen, church, we've got a testimony in this community. People know Living Water Baptist Church. And you're, you are the church. Where you work, where you live, you're the church. 
what kind of what kind of disciple are you are you like Peter doing harm to people are you like Jesus that is healing people that's doing good